So welcome, comadres and friends. My name is Maria Ferrer. I am the executive director of Las Comadres para las Américas. And tonight, I am very excited to have with us Adriana Dominguez, who is the new partner at Evitas Creative Management. Congratulations. Everybody applaud. Applaud, applaud. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so Adriana, tell us, what is Evitas Creative Management and who do you represent? Okay, um, let's see. Um, Evita's Creative Management is um, is an agency, a literary agency that's based um, in New York, but we also have offices in London, Boston, and many other places. We have over 30 agents. Um, so it's, it's a rather large um, agency and um, focuses on both adult and children's books. Um, very strong in the nonfiction area. Um, we're actually proudly number one on Publishers Marketplace for nonfiction. So um, it represent a, um, a broad array of books, uh, again, on both the adult and children's side. I think the books that um, that has surprised me the most or uh, impressed me the most when I was considering <laughs> coming over to Avidas were um, uh, uh, I'm not your perfect Mexican daughter. Uh, uh, daughter. Yeah, that that uh, that book is is Navita's book, um, and um, and it's going to be a film, as you know, and it's going to be directed by America Ferrera, who's also represented by Navita. So, um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so there is a there is a great uh, pool of talent, and um, and uh, they were doing really great on both the adult and the children's side when they first approached me, but they were really looking to um, uh, have a stronger foothold in the children's uh, market, which I've been in for, you know, working on for a long time. And so when they approached me about coming on to the agency and, and, and being in the, uh, you know, joining them as a, as a both adult and children's agent, my first thought was, um, you know, I sort of need a reason, uh, as Nora knows very well. I kind of like to start things, <laughs> stir things up as much as the, like Nora does, and uh, we've teamed up before. And uh, and I sort of felt that this presented a really great opportunity because I had done something like that before on both the editorial side and the agenting side, and you know, and the writers' conference side and <laughs> everything else. So, so. Um, uh, so, so I thought that was a great opportunity to actually um, present the, the possibility of formalizing the children's side of the agency and creating a whole new division, which is exactly what we ended up doing. Um, so the the umbrella, the, the the name of the agency as a whole is Avita's Creative Management, but I came on board in part um, to, along with Rick Richter, who's uh, legendary in the children's world. Um, he's a co-founder of Candlewick. He was the president and publisher of Simon & Schuster Children's uh, many moons ago. And the two of us teamed up to launch ACM Kids and Illustration, which now stands as part of the Vitas, but also in its own, has its own website, you know, all of its own resources. And so it, it was really, um, it was, it was, it was sort of uh, the agency really got behind, um, you know, this idea of, of 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 focusing on the children's side and and committing to committing resources, committing time, all of that, which is very important. You know, when you've been around for a long time, you sort of want to know that folks are going to walk the walk too, right? And so <laughs> that's what they did, and that's why I'm very happy to to be a part of the agency. I still work on both children and adult. My adult list is um, is more select um, in terms of uh, in, in the genre and all that. We can talk about that later. I'm sure you're going to ask those questions. But um, so yeah, that's a that's a bit of Vita's. And about what was the second question? <laughs> I lost like some it. of the people you represent. Well, we know that oh, you that represent, I represent Erica San San Sanchez and I'm America Ferrer. Yeah, Ferreira. I don't represent I don't represent them. They were they were here before I came on board. Um, I represent, actually, it's funny, you sent me uh, the link for the interview that you did with Michelle Herrera Mulligan, and I represented one of the books that she mentioned, or I represent one of the books that that um, that she mentioned uh, in that conversation, which is uh, Once I Was You by Marina Hosta. So that's probably the one that most people will recognize. Um, and uh, so I, I'm working on another book um, that's called Detain that is coming out next year that is... Um, the first book um, written by 
um, by someone who was detained in one of the infamous uh, child detention detention centers uh, during the uh, during the Trump presidency. He was thirteen when he was detained, and he spent some time there. So, it's a uh, it's a book that I'm very proud of. It's coming out next year, um, and we're he while he was detained he created a journal and uh so we're we're collecting all of that all of those writings um you know sort of uh, in, in giving folks a real um you know look into what was actually happening in those detention centers but at the at the at its core is really a story about hope and about friendship and about you know, supporting others and collaboration and all of that. So it's not as dire as it sounds, although it does present a very realistic view also of what went on and what brought him there and all of that. So that's another book that has already been announced so I can talk about it. Uh, and Michelle is also publishing that book. So Wonderful. Now, so uh, you are now a partner. You are now yes. a partner at Evita's Creative Management. Um, so first is, are you still an agent even though you're a partner? Yes, very much okay. so. And what are your new responsibilities as a partner? Uh, yes, obviously a very resilient young man. Um, <laughs> Nora, um, what are my new duties? Really, I mean, it's it's more about having a, a place at the table. It's, you know, there are, there are, there are uh, quarterly meetings that partners, you know, attend where we sort of talk about the direction of the agency as a whole, where ideas are exchanged and brought up where things are um, uh, sort of uh, discussed and sometimes voted on and, and all of that. So it's really ha about having a bigger stake in the agency and what goes on. Um, I can't say I'm not a senior partner and I'm certainly not one of the CEOs. So I can't say that I'm solely responsible for any one thing that happens at the agency, but I can say that I have a seat at the table when those conversations happen. And I think that's really important. I also think um, well, I know that one of the reasons I, that they asked me to become partner is um, is, a, is a direct result of all the work that I did in launching the children's division, which was, you know, uh, it was an undertaking and, uh, and, uh, and something that we all really firmly believe added a lot of value to the agency as a whole. So and we've since acquired or sort of joined with another agency, Ruben Pfeiffer um, Entertainment, um, is it Ruben Pfeiffer? I'm sorry. It's it's not entertainment. It's, it's something else. But Ruben Pfeiffer, who's you know also legendary, he's been around for 50 years, um, also uh, on the children's side. And uh, he recently joined ACM. So he he brought his entire list of clients over to ACM. So it's it's ever since I launched it two years ago, it's already grown exponentially. The uh, the division. Wonderful. Now tell yeah. us about your journey to partnership. You started as an editor. Oh, wow. So yeah. tell us about your journey when you were a long one. just a little bit, you know, when you were an editor at, at uh, was it Scholastic? A baby editor? Yes. A baby uh, editor. <laughs> I was a baby editor at Scholastic. Um, yeah, I started out at Scholastic. I feel like in publishing, particularly in children's publishing, all roads re lead through Scholastic. I can't tell you how many people I've met that it's just, you know, oh, yeah, I worked at Scholastic part time, full time, you know, project based, whatever. It, it's incredible. Um, um, and that's sort of what happened to me. I started out, I, 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 um, I worked at Scholastic at, in the education department. I was hired on a project basis. Um, I, I know you have a question about being bilingual and being bilingual in that or bilingualism, but being bilingual personally helped me a lot early on in my career. They were looking not only for a children's editor, but also a bilingual children's editor, which sort of um, helped me. And um, I'm sorry, and so do I, you guys represent English books and Spanish books? We're talking about Scholastic, right? When I first yes. started out? Yes. Um. Does Scholastic do Spanish books? Oh, that's Scholastic. Oh, no, because you said represent, so you threw me off. Okay. Oh, sorry. Um, it's okay. Um, well, Scholastic had an entire bilingual division uh, when I first started out. And they, one of the things that that division did, uh, it was part of the larger education department, and they put together entire reading programs in Spanish. Ooh, okay. So um, Tess probably knows this better than anybody, but you know, school districts, when they when they uh, they acquire entire reading programs and that's sort of a big business for educational publishers mcgraw hill and many others do this and scholastic at the time had uh had its own uh in spanish 
And <clears throat> they needed folks to, editors who are bilingual, who, who would be able to adapt their English programs into Spanish in a way that made them authentic um, as well, and not merely translations of, of English programs. They, you know, we, so, and that's, that's how my interest in trade uh, publishing really blossomed because one of the things that I got to do, even though I was working in the education department and in educational programs, then the the educational, um, per, the, I'm sorry, the reading programs, uh, one of the components of the reading programs were classroom libraries. <clears throat> and so I had to assemble classroom, uh, a classroom library to go with this program. And the way to do that was to reach out to trade publishers and figure out and find books that aligned with all of the contents and all of the curriculum uh, requirements and, and, and so on and so forth. It gets very complicated, but um, but that was my my first foray into, into trade publishing. And I saw that there was like a whole other world out there and a whole other way of doing things. And I was very interested. I found it very freeing because as wonderful as it is to be, to work on reading programs, they also very, you know, they're, they're a little restrictive because they have to follow curricula, you know, and, and all of this. So trade to me signified something that was a little bit, that gave me a little bit more freedom to, to work on, on different types of projects. So kind of piqued my interest there. And, um, and yeah, and that's how I first started it. So I started in education and then um, once I got that peek into trade publishing, once I left Scholastic, I worked for, um, I freelanced for other publishers on both the adult and children's side for a while in both languages, um, in English and Spanish, because I'm fully bilingual, so that always comes in handy. Um, and eventually I became a book reviewer, uh, which was something I never planned on, <laughs> <laughs> but... And I worked at Library Journal, uh, again, <laughs> sort of working on something that had just recently launched. There was a magazine called Critica's Magazine. Many, many, many years ago, some many years may ago. remember it. I was the children's review editor for Critica's Magazine. And, uh, and so that's how I got to see yet another aspect of publishing, which was, you know, how, how do we get these books into the hands of readers? And um, and reviews were, and during that time, at least a very big part of that. And so I did that for a while. And um, and so, so at that point I had been an editor and a book reviewer, um, the, uh, well, a, a freelance editor. The only thing left was for me to go back to full-time editorial work, which is what I did when I went over to Harper Palace after that. And uh, and there I did something very similar to what Michelle is doing now, which was to help uh, launch the children's again launch <laughs> the children's division of <clears throat> there's a, there's a pattern definitely there's a through line through my entire career I can tell you that um, uh, the children's division of Rio, which um, you know Rene Alegria had brilliantly directed on the adult side, but he knew nothing about children's books and he wanted to, you know, he talked to the CEO of HarperCollins at that time and told him, you know, we're having great success on the adult side. We need to be doing this on the children's side as well. But he, he didn't know the first thing of how to do that. So, and he was smart enough to look for somebody that, that did. And so- um, And you were just and right so there. <laughs> and I was right there. That's, yeah, I was right there just waiting. I mean, I think half of life is just being prepared, right? <laughs> you just be prepared for the moment when it arrives. And yeah, so I was prepared for the moment. It was a little intimidating, I will say. I was fairly young still, and I had never launched anything at that point. Um, but um, but it was incredibly rewarding. And there are some really well-known authors and illustrators that I actually launched at Ryo. Um, that or, or that were you know I published for the first time on the trade side at Rio, um, you know like uh, Monica Brown and Rafael Lopez. I published them all before um, any of the other big then five publishers. Uh, Rio was was you know broke a lot of ground, and I'm very proud of that. Um, should I go on? Well, how I did you get? So now tell <laughs> us. So we've seen your 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 whole career. So tell us how you got to be on the other side of the desk. Now you're yes. an agent. So how did you go from being on the editor side to on the other side of the desk, and now you're the agent? Yeah. Well, there were a couple of re there were a couple of things that influenced that. One of them um, 
I think the main one from a personal perspective was that I had um, learned enough about publishing to also know about its limitations. So when you work um, for, you know, with a specific publishing house, you know, to some degree, you're um, bound, you know, by the tastes and, you know, interests and desires of that particular organization. You know, you have to take your books to an acquisitions meeting. You have to have, um, you know, you have to gather support for your books and, and so on and so forth. And, and, and different, different publishers do have different tastes and different ways of doing things and different ways of acquiring books. And, and they go through different cycles of things that they're interest them and all of that. And so after having worked for a singular publisher for a very long time, um, and around 2008, when the bottom fell out of everything, um, I, you know, and I sort of, had an existential crisis. <laughs> I thought, what do I want to do next? And I thought, well, one thing I don't want to do next is to sort of be in this position where I'm kind of at the mercy of, you know, what a publisher maybe want to publish at any particular time. Because I, while I was at Harper, one of, as much as I loved it, the one thing that I disliked about that time was that there were some books that I believed in very, very strongly that I just could not get past through, through acquisitions. I just could not get support in-house support for. And and I went on to seeing those books being published by other publishers and be successful and help to launch those authors and knowing full well that, you know, I had seen them first and I, you know, <laughs> and so that was frustrating. And so and so that's that's when I really thought, um, do I want to stay in publishing? You know, under with under which conditions, what would be the ideal? condition for me to do this to continue to do this at a time when it was really I mean you know 2008 was was a really challenging time for publishing there were publishers weekly was you know had pages and pages of the names and and, and email addresses of people that were getting laid off on a daily basis I mean it was just it was really it, it was a kind of a do or die moment and so and so I asked myself you know what do I want to do so I you know had a little bit of a severance and I had a few savings and I thought, okay, I'm going to try this agenting thing for a little while. And um, if it doesn't work out during, you know, after a while, I'll, uh, you know, I'll figure out what's next. And, uh, and I just really loved it. I love the freedom of it. I love being able to talk to, to authors, you know, I mean, I, I, it's still very much a business. I still have to figure out whether a project is, you know, viable, at least in my eyes, um, you know, if I can think of enough editors that will be interested in the project, it's not as, you know, it's not all like, you know, unicorns and rainbows, obviously, it's still a business, but, but I have choices, I have choices that I didn't have as an editor, as an agent, you know, this project is not, is not good for this house, but I know that house will love it. And if I can think of two or three editors that will love a project when I first look at it, then that's good enough for me. And, and obviously, if I feel strongly about it. So, so that was the reason that I made that that switch, and um, and the other thing that I realized was, after having been, you know, having worked in educational uh, publishing and you know being the book reviewer, I actually did a short stint with on sales. I worked for Baker and Taylor on a freelance basis. Mm -hmm. I mean, it it was crazy. So it was like I've had my hand in all aspects of publishing, and I know that I can take all of this knowledge, and use it to help my clients. So it's not just editorial or agency services that I provide. It's sort of like a comprehensive view of the of the industry. Sort of, you know, when I talk to an editor, I've been to those meetings. I know. I try to arm them with the, with the information and the tools that they need to, you know, to essentially go into a, into a room where sometimes, you know, people are lovely and fuzzy and they love a project, and sometimes they sit there and just wait for you to prove them wrong. You know, and it's sort of like. Um, so, so yeah, so I'm very conscious of like all of those processes when, and, and I apply them to my work. Mm -hmm. Are your clients that are, that are now authors, um, do you, is there uh, a mix of like Latinos and non-Latinos that you have? And are you doing like books that are in English and books that are in Spanish, you know, representing those kind of books and pushing those kind of books at Evitas? Um, you know, it's funny, um, you know, I, I mean, I only represent projects that I feel really, really passionate about because again, you know, if, if I'm to present them to someone else, I feel like, 
people can smell it if you don't love something, you know, it's sort of like, so I have to really love everything that I work on. And of course, you know, very many of the projects that I love are produced by Latinx creators. I mean, that's just a fact. And so I don't know what the percentage is. It's probably like 80. <laughs> it's not a hundred, but it is very, very high. Um, and it always has been. And, um, and, you know, I just, I, I think there's a level of nuance and, and uh, that only another Latinx professional can sort of, you know, pick up on, be aware of, share. Um, and so I feel like it's almost like my duty and I don't do it out of duty, out of obligation. I do it as a sort of a moral duty to myself. Like, I feel like, well, if I'm equipped to really help, you know, a, a Latino or Latina, you know, um, creator, uh, get published like why wouldn't I you know just like just it's mm -hmm, just for mm -hmm. you know and so so yeah so I, I do tend to I don't know I think maybe like 80 percent of my list is that mm -hmm. now we have a lot Not of people in design. the audience yeah we have a mm -hmm. lot of people in the audience who are um who want to become editors and who want to become mm -hmm. agents you know they want to enter the publishing industry and stuff so are there any you know, anything that you've learned over the years that works, you know, like, is there a school? Is there a, 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 a magazine or, you know, is like Publishers Weekly, like a, a Bible that you should be reading? You know, what are some tips about being getting into publishing industry? Well, I mean, first of all, the world has changed so much since I first started out in the mid 90s. So, I mean, there was there was no social media when I started out. So um so it's like a whole different ball game now but there are some mainstays you know I mean, like you said i mean you mentioned publishers weekly so there are um there are so many ways to actually go into publishing but at the same time there are so many more people that want to get into publishing that it really um requires i think deep commitment um and the very first thing i would say for anybody that wants to go into publishing is make absolutely sure that this is what you want to do um, because it's not the best paying job in the world. <laughs> you know, it's not like, you know, the, the going, you know, the going joke in publishing is like, nobody ever goes into publishing to become a millionaire. It just, you just don't, you know, you go into publishing because you absolutely love books um, because um, you want to see a certain type of book, you know, get published because you, you love reading all of that. So, so you have to be a reader first. So it, we hear this all the time, but I think the best way to to familiarize yourself with publishing is to read as much as you possibly can, not only to become aware of what's being published, um, but also so that you can hone your own tastes and, you know, and interests. You can figure out what it is that moves you because there are very many, you know, different ways that you can go into publishing. You can go into adult publishing. You can go into children's publishing. You can, you know, there are editors who publish you know, exclusively nonfiction. There are editors who publish, you know, sort of more literary works and 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 there are others who publish, you know, sort of genre heavy, you know, fiction. So so and and those all have their place and they don't always overlap. And so I think so it's really important for you to know exactly what it is that you like, because that's that's what you should be sort of, you know, focusing on. And, um, and, you know, there are certain things that I know nothing about, despite the fact that I've been in publishing for 25 years, because they're just areas that I've never covered, that I've never worked on. So, so if you love romance, you know, read all of the romance novels that have been publishing in the last, published in the last three to five years, anything older than that is probably by publishing standards outdated, because publishing moves very much in cycles and, and, you know, sort of trends, you know, I hate that word, but, you know, trends come and go. And so, so if you're looking, you know, uh, the telltale sign for me when somebody tells me, I, you know, I'm a writer or, or I'm a writer or when I go into publishing or whatever, and, and they cite books that are over five years old, sometimes over 10 years old, or they tell me about the books that they loved as children, it's sort of like what tells me about, you know, when those are the only books that you can name, what that tells me is that you have not read a book that's been published recently in a very long time, or you just don't know that that's what we want to hear. So, um, so I think that's the number one bit of advice, you know, figure out what kind of book speaks to you, um, read into that particular, um, 
you know, genre, or, or, you know, format or whatever it is, age group, whatever it is, as much as you possibly can, familiarize yourself. Um, uh, you know, social media, you know, has all kinds of different ways of going about things. There are like, there are pitch sessions, you know, on Twitter and online, there are pitch sessions for Latinx, you know, authors, there are pitch sessions for African American authors, there's like, like Latinx pitch and black pitch and all these other things those are for authors so that's that social media has opened those doors um you know uh, sort of like a back door into publishing through those through um you know um so no and, pitch and there sessions are... for agents <clears throat> yeah agents <laughs> participate well oh you mean no no, for, no i mean become an agent <laughs> yes you need a pitch session to become an agent yeah, well, I think I think a lot of the people that are going into publishing these days are going through one of the publishing programs. Um, not not all of them, but um, if they're not going through the publishing programs, usually what they're doing is that they're getting internships. Uh, you know, whether that's that's definitely um, one of the main ways that that you know agents source uh, you know talent, uh, agencies source talent. You know, they 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 bring in and. Um, um, sorry, uh, interns, and you know, they, so they can familiarize themselves with what it means to be an agent, what agents do, et cetera, et cetera. And you know, even if they don't get, you know, we've had so many. Uh, um, it's it's kind of amazing to me. The Vita is uh, one of the things that I've noticed in the last couple of years being here because it is a larger agency. We get every every uh, semester we take on uh, three uh, three interns, and. I've gone on to see so many of them get, you know, get, get jobs in publishing, like as editors or, you know, or, or as junior agents or, you know, what have you. So it's really, it's, it's finding your, you know, a way to get your foot in the door. Um, and so publishing programs are good because as I said, you know, they generally do have sort of like a offer a direct line into publishing. And, and that's one of the ways in which they do it is the internships, but then also just keep your eyes, you know, peeled for opportunities like that. I think, one of the challenges for us and for communities of color in particular is that, you know, um, oftentimes we can't work on paid jobs. And so I think um, publishing has become to, begun to recognize that if they want to diversify the industry, if we want to diversify the industry, that one of the very first things we need to do is to start paying interns. <laughs> and so, so that it doesn't, so it's not, you know, something that's reserved only for those who have, you know, parents who can pay their rent for six months at a time, you know, so, um, and so, for example, like Avita's internships, as well as many other agencies and publishers now, you know, the internships are paid. Yeah. So, yeah. so you can afford to, to, you know, I mean, it's still New York. Mm -hmm. You still have to pay New York We're rent. Still expensive. So that's, yes, that's yeah. a problem in and of itself that we cannot solve with publishing alone. But, but you know, but that didn't exist. I mean, when I first started out, the internships are mostly unpaid. So you know, that's been um, a, a positive change, I think. Um, so I would look into that, and then um, because you know that um, we need mm -hmm. diverse books has uh, those internship programs, and Latinx in publishing also has internship programs. Yep. Um, and those are good places to start to make those connections because what you want to do is make those connections to editors and, and book reviewers and, you know, people in the industry. You have to know who's in the industry. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and yeah, exactly. And I, I think there are more organizations who are who are more consciously, you know, trying to do that. And as I said, I mean, I think the institutions themselves are now using these organizations to to source material and also keeping in mind that they do have to pay their interns and that mm -hmm. they can't expect people to just you know work for free now Publishing give is us wonderful, some but... tips <laughs> now give us some tips um if i'm an author and uh and i want to get an agent so you know what are some tips that i should know about how to find an agent and how to 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 deal with an agent you know how to deal with an agent sounds, doesn't sound so good, but okay. <laughs> I know that's not what you meant. Um, so how to find an agent. So the easiest, um, well, there are a few ways of finding an agent. So there, there are free ways and then there are paid ways and everything in between. So, um, so one of the things that most agents do is that we report our deals to something called Publishers Marketplace. And Publishers Marketplace 
has a free option, which is basically you go on their website, you could sign up for their newsletter, and then you get um, a list of the deals that they publish. And the deals that are published, so when a new book deal is com it comes out and or, or when it's reported to Publishers Marketplace, it'll it'll have the name of the author, the name of the editor, and the name of the agent. So, um, and those the, that database in particular, if you're a full member, and for that you have to pay, they're searchable. So, so you can do one or two things. You can sort of um, go the free route, which is always a little bit harder, right? I mean, but you can still get these free newsletters and get the deals and, and sort of keep up with what's being published, what's being acquired. It also It's also a really great way of getting sort of like, you know, a sort of a microcosm of publishing, right? Just kind of seeing what's being, that's how, that's when I look at that newsletter, that's how I look at it. I look at it, I, I do look for trends. I'm like, what are editors, um, you know, acquiring these days? And, and who or who they are. And um, so that's one way. And then the other way is if you pay, I think it's like 20 or $25 a month, um, then you get full access. So then you can go and you can go to like a, a searchable database and then you, you can search by genre, by age group, by, you know, by agency, by, by house, you know, by author, any, any you know, any um, uh, search, uh, uh, you know, uh, that you, that you, that interests you. And, um, and then you, you know, then you get a more customized list. So that's, that's, that's the easiest way. And it's the one that's kind of the gold standard for the industry. I mean, we, that's where everything gets reported or nearly everything. There's also Publishers Weekly that, and Publishers Weekly um, has a lot of free newsletters also. So you can, you can uh, sign up for a full membership of Publishers Weekly and pay, you know, whatever it is, a couple hundred dollars a year, but you can, but you could also sign up for the new, for the free newsletter. So if you're interested in children's books, for example, they have a, something called Publishers Weekly Children's Bookshelf, where they also um, announce all of the, the, the book deals of the week. And that's a free newsletter that you can get right in your inbox. So there's a lot of information that's readily available. Um, it just you just have to look in the right places. Um, but those those two are really the main um, the main sources I think for most of the deals that are that are that are announced. And so what I would do if I were an author is I would look at Publishers Marketplace, at Publishers Weekly, look at for books that are similar to my own that you know are similar genres. You know maybe books that sound you know, in, in some way uh, like mine and um, and see who the editors acquiring them are because it's always good to know the names even if you can't go to them directly because most of the time you can't. Um, and then look at those agents. Uh, look at look at the agents that are representing those projects. And then once you do that, I would go to those agents' websites because the best information you're going to get about how to get an agent is is, is found readily it's readily available on most agencies websites which will list you know the agents their interests whether they're open for submissions what they're open for so it's it's a step that is often skipped um at your own peril because you know you're wasting time if you submit something to someone who is not interested in the kind of work that you do or is not open you know to submissions for whatever reason and um it's you know it's kind of a waste of time for you and a waste of time for the agent and uh, you want to target um, your submissions to to the right people right I mean it just the law of averages so so I would do that I would visit the websites um, of the agencies that that I've discovered during these other um, using these other resources and uh, and then write a really really good query letter. <laughs> There and there are so many, so many places that you can go to, you know, to get information on how to write a good query letter. That I'm, I'm not going to start listing those because those are very long. But you know, there, there's everything from writers' conferences to books to you know to tutorials to blogs. I mean, you can do a search and YouTube. find out. <laughs> YouTube. I always forget YouTube. YouTube is always <laughs> like the one I forget. But yeah, YouTube. You can YouTube there. anything these days. Yes, it does everything. Now, are you looking for anything in, spe in specific? Are you open to new submissions? <clears throat> well, funny you should ask. So, um, I'm I'm not open to most things, but I can make exceptions to those rules. <laughs> so, 
what I can do and what I often do, if I participate in a, in a I'm, I'm only open to author illustrators right now, um, simply because I'm just, I'm short on time and I don't have a ton of time to read you know, full length novels right now. I just, I just don't have that kind of time. And if I open for novels, it'll, it'll just be um, setting my, you know, uh, setting myself and a whole lot of other people up for disappointment because I just don't have the time. But, um, but what I often do when I participate in, participate in, in programs like this one, or I go to conferences or anything, I just encourage uh, attendees to query me anyway and, and mention you know, whether in this case, Las Covades para Las Americas, so that I know that there is a connection and there's a reason why <laughs> everything I say in my query box, you know, my query tracker is being ignored. And and I will and I will look at those. I will give those special considerations. So you're yeah. okay if we share your email? You well, you, what you can share is my query tracker, which or okay. the website, because it actually well, again, going, you know, following my own logic. What I would say is go to the website, find out the kinds of projects that I do take on when I am open to everything, because there are things that I still don't work on. I don't work on romance, for example. I don't work, you know, on the adult side, I do very little fiction to none. I do mostly nonfiction. So the fiction that I do is mostly on the children's side. So, um, so yeah, so go to my website first, find out what types of books here. interest me. And then I'm you have a direct link. Tracker. Yeah. Tracker. Exactly. And then you have a direct link to my query tracker. So when you query me, just mention Las Comadas para las Americas. There is, there, is a, there is a spot on the query form that actually says refer to buy. And right there, you can put Las Comadas para las Americas and it'll get my attention. It's the very first thing you see on the query. Mm -hmm. But you're not looking at adult books. So they what, what you're looking for is children's books and illustrators. By illustrators, do you mean like um, people with picture books? Yes. Graphic novels? Yes. All of that. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Author, author illustrators, um, illustrators only who may aspire to writing one day because I do prefer an illustrator who could also or, or, or would like to write at some point. Um, and I'm always open to, um, well, not, I'm, I'm not always open, but I, I generally uh, am open to nonfiction on the adult side. So I work on memoir, prescriptive, that sort of thing. I don't work on fiction a whole lot um, at all, really. I mean, uh, on the adult side. Okay. I'm putting down your the website as well so they can read more about you. So um, let's open up the floor. I know we have a couple of questions already. So let's look at some of the questions. Um, do you represent screenwriters? No. I don't, I don't, but we do have a fantastic film and TV department that it is, um, which uh, is another, you know, another, another thing that appealed mm -hmm. to me about the agency. We have a great TV film department, a foreign language department, a contracts department. We have all these great resources. And so screenwriters, I don't represent, but I, from time to time, I hear from screenwriters who have written something else that is, you know, that is that you know with the idea of, of turning it into a book rather than a than a screenplay and if that you know if that's the case um the advantage of having an, an agency that has a film and tv department is that if you're both a novelist or you know or a nonfiction author and a screenwriter it's kind of like a one-stop shop right i mean if you're both if you want to turn your book into a screenplay and not the other way around well, even the other way around. I mean, if if you're willing to do the work, <laughs> that's, you know, that's if if that's what you want to do. But it has to be a book first. We're a literary agency. the 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 film and TV rights that we represent are all based on on books on, on you know on on uh, on material that was published first as a book. Okay, and um, are there? Do you find that there are more opportunities for bilingual books? Glenda has a bilingual kids cookbook. What do you think? Oh, that's interesting. But okay, uh, uh, uh okay, a bilingual. So it's a it's a cookbook for kids. Yes, I just want to make sure that I understand. Are you available? You want to talk? Yes. No. Um. It's it's been published. Actually, today's my book birthday. <laughs> um. Oh, happy birthday. Thank happy you. Birthday. Thing? Oh yeah, it's amazing. Um, it was a, a long time coming. Um, 
but when uh, we were in discussion with the publisher, they only wanted to do the Spanish version. They were saying they didn't want to do English and Spanish because obviously it's double the pages. Formatting was challenging, and but I insisted and took a while, but they came back and agreed to it. And you prevailed. Um, wow, good for you. <laughs> So, I mean, I just, I mean, I know it's, it's kind of a financial move, like, okay, double the pages and formatting yeah, it has its challenges, but it just opens up um, your readership you know, tremendously. And um, so I'm just wondering, hopefully that's maybe a trend that's happening. I don't know if you're seeing it on your end, if that there's more bilingual books available. Oh yeah. I, I mean, I'm sorry, go on. Oh no, it just, I mean, I'm just hoping that we're going to see more of that rather than having it separate, like the Spanish section that's in the corner that, you know, doesn't get a lot of no. love. <laughs> no, yeah, no, I've, I've seen bilingual books for a very, very long time. Actually, bilingual books have been around on the children's side for as long as I've worked in publishing. Uh, mm -hmm. So the, there definitely are many of those. One publisher on the children's side that does quite a few of them is um, Leon Lowe Press. I don't know if you're familiar oh, with yeah. them. Yes, they also and they acquired Children's Press, which was originally, um, I think, exclusively a bilingual um, mm -hmm. press, and they acquired them and all of their titles, all of their backlist. So, what the sort of larger, you know, so-called big five publishers are doing now on the children's side more is publishing English and Spanish editions side by side. Mm -hmm. Um. um and uh, so, like, I think, I don't, I don't know who your publisher is, but it, it, is it an indie publisher? No, or is it's it one a of the big five? Planeta. Oh, okay. Well, that explains why they went to publish in Spanish first. Okay. Right. <laughs> uh, okay. So then the USA? USA the, I, I, yes, yeah, it's Planeta USA. USA. Mm -hmm. it, it's Planeta USA? Yes. Oh, that's great. Yeah, I met with those folks not too long ago. That's, that's cool. Uh, yeah, that's really great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They uh yeah they're just uh they're just getting started too so that's a great time to kind of you know get in on the ground floor so that exactly. hopefully that'll that'll work in your favor but um yeah I can see what they would what you know I, my first my first reaction to your question was who's the publisher precisely for that reason because usually mm -hmm. those decisions are made um around you know what the publisher perceives as their market and so right. it's not only just about uh, production costs sometimes sometimes is like you know are we investing this much money and you know in the production of a book that we don't necessarily know how to sell mm -hmm. so that's that's usually the bigger concern um okay. and then those two go hand in hand right because you don't want to lose money on a book so um so i think um if you feel confident in that what i would say is you know try to do the best that you can to support the book to help them come up with ideas and, and all of that for promotion if you have yeah, ideas I make do. sure you have a have a hand in those conversations you know that's Definitely. one of the things that I do as an agent and I love doing is to once the book gets closer to publication about six to nine months we mm -hmm. get on the phone with like the editors and the marketing team and the publicity team and we just have like a brainstorm about like mm -hmm. how do we get this book into the hands of as many readers as possible and those exactly. conversations often um yield a lot of great ideas so yeah sure yeah I, um it was I think an author's guild um, workshop that I took and the best piece of advice she's like get um, a spreadsheet and write down all your contacts and all your ideas about promotion and they sent that and they were thrilled and that's my, been my checklist I'm like okay I email those people and I've been doing a lot of the footwork and so because they're based in Mexico and Miami so I'm in SoCal so they don't have I mean they know people here but it's not as homegrown as you know what I could do here so and I do feel like the California, yeah, and readership is like somewhat under underserved by publishers. I don't know if it's because we're well on New York, we just really don't know how to. But if you do have contacts in that area, chances are, you know, um, you might be opening markets for them and helping them in the process too. Mm -hmm. So it's like, a, you know, yeah, um, I'm sure any information that you give them about that market will be welcome. <laughs> you know, so, <laughs> um, so that's. Anna had a question about, um, we you. know that you don't really do um, adult books, but um, Anna's interested in what other types of genre do they have for adults? Do you represent, does Avitas represent for adults? You know, like romance you were saying, nonfiction you were saying, um, what else? Memoirs? Yeah. 
Yeah, and Vito's is, and because we have so many agents, I mean, we have, you know, like I said, 30 plus agents. So we have agents that represent absolutely everything from nonfiction to fiction to genre to, you know, there are agents even within the children's department that do YA better than I do. Um, so yeah, it's just a matter of going to the website and just looking at the agents, um, uh, you know, bios and what they're looking for, but you have a really broad selection at the website. So I would really encourage you to go and take a look and see, see who's open. Um, the other thing that I really like about Avidas is that despite the fact that I, I you know, I, I am obviously when you visit the, the agency's website, the only Latina at the agency, um, there, they were, they've always been interested in, in publishing underrepresented voices. That's always been part of their mission. And so, um, you know, long before I came. So, so if you look at not just the agents, but also the people they represent, you will definitely see representation across the board. Um, and that's, that's something to pay attention to also. Okay, perfect. Now, Charlie has a question about um, the nonfiction and stuff. Charlie, do you want to talk? Yeah, that would be great. So um, you mentioned that you, that you're looking for nonfiction. I, I pay, specifically write nonfiction um, sexuality books, but mostly what I've been writing lately are books on breast cancer. Um, and so I actually wrote a play, um, Breast Cancer Diaries, which won two awards last year for mm -hmm. best drama and um, best screen or best short script. And so, yay. Really Congratulations. Thank you. Um, and we've actually performed it several times. This year, we're actually performing it with a comedy club. Um, so it's comedians that are going to be performing um, the the play. And so it, it's going to take a whole new feel for it. But it's all about having breast cancer and going through the whole process. Um, you know, and it's it's seven, it's eight actors, seven men, one or excuse me, seven women, one man and all about what you go through it. And so, um, you know, I'm looking at how to take that to be able to make it into a, a film, I guess. We've recorded it a couple of times um, and being able to do that. And then um, on top of that, I also am writing a, a new book um, called uh, Breast Cancer 101, What You Should Know But Aren't Told. And it's like 150 questions that nobody talks to you about. You know, everything from how to get free bras to how to get back and forth to your therapy sessions or your chemotherapy and, and just the living instead of just trying to survive while you're doing um going through the process and so i'm i'm curious as to who to talk to about that um who did you know both the play and the book and the play to do that the play i honestly would know because as i said we have a film and tv department that does a far better job than i ever could in that area i mean they have all the contacts and they just bring me in when they have something to share so i you know i'm, yeah, I'm learning We've done three documentaries along along those lines as well. So, yeah. yeah. No, I mean, I, what that says to me is that you have a platform, right? And I mean, I think yeah. that's one of the first things that I would do is to kind of assemble all this information and um, and put together a proposal that allows you to position the book in such a way because you have all of this background in this particular area, you know, around this particular subject and, and sort of share all of your ideas there. I think that when it comes to sort of manuals or how to areas of expertise, what most agents and editors are looking for are folks who are expert in their fields and or have platforms. And I'm sure you've heard this before because like the yeah. platform is like the, the keyword for nonfiction, right? So, um, so I think, it's if you look at how to put together a nonfiction proposal, it sort of forces you to put, focus your efforts in that direction and kind of see what is it that you're bringing to the table beyond the content, because, you know, content, of course, is the most important. We come without content. We, <laughs> we don't have a book. But I think for nonfiction, it's, you know, and the reason for that is simply because, you know, an editor needs to be able to pitch you as an expert 
you know, to all of the shows and, you know, and to all, and, and, and to all of the magazines and all of that. And sort of like you have, you need to have that kind of the byline, that sort of background that justifies you being the person to talk about this particular subject. Otherwise it's really difficult to get attention from, from the media. Right. And so if you look at, as I said, have you ever attempted to put together a nonfiction proposal and, you know, sort of like a skeleton, have you, you know, sort of um, fill in the skeleton of a of a proposal. No, I would I would say no. I mean, I I've I've talked to a lot of media. We've been in the media like crazy for the past couple of years, especially in Florida. Um, you know, and doing the plays, but I I've never just sat down and started writing everything. And then when I do, it's like pages and pages long, and and so people are like, "Well, you're saying too much." It's like, but you asked me for everything that I've done. And it's like, you know, it's like three, four pages worth of, of stuff. And I haven't even gone to part two, you know? Yeah. Um, well, I think, so you know, I think what Glenda, I'm sorry, it was Glenda, right? I'm looking at your name. Yeah. So it was Glenda. I think what Glenda mentioned, I mean, you know, that she did for her publisher is something that you're going to, it is is similar to what we're talking about here. And it's yeah. something that you're going to have to do down the line anyway is to kind of put these lists together for your for your publisher and you know maybe an agent uh hopefully will help you to you know that's part of the role of the agent to kind of help you to parse the information and see what's helpful and what isn't but yeah. um but i think I, I would definitely start with with just the classic proposal which is basically you know just kind of an overview of the project you know the you know the, the if you've done media you know just kind of listing all of that the market as you understand it you know why is there a need for this book and so on and so forth you know there, it's very formulaic a, a nonfiction proposal so it's that's it's it's literally like you know if you look at a, how to how to write a nonfiction proposal it's sort of a skeleton that you have to fill in so um so i would encourage you to do that because that'll help you to determine you know, who is, it, it also kind of, I, what I find when I help folks put together nonfiction proposals is that it sort of crystallizes not only who you're, first, who you're trying to reach, you know, who is your target reader, right? Because, you know, the, a book does not exist without a reader, right? So, right? so who is your target readership? And then also in the process, it oftentimes from the creative perspective, which you know, it's is 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 you know more interesting sounding than, <laughs> than the, all the other stuff is, you know, it helps to crystallize what is your message? What is it that you're trying to say? So I find a lot of value in putting together these proposals, both just from a viability standpoint and from a creative standpoint, because it's, if you've, because what I hear is you've done so much and it sort of helps you to kind of, you know, put right. it all together in a way that is digestible for someone else to understand. And if you can do that, then you're in a position to present it to someone, um, and, and that person can give you feedback that you can actually use. Like, you know, oh, this, you know, this helps, this doesn't, you know, oh, right. this is what you need to do. So I think um, I, for me, that would be the very first step for your own sake, before you even share it with anyone else to help you, okay. to, to give you direction. Because it sounds like you have a hand in a lot of things, which is, you know, successful people usually do, but it's, yeah. you know, when I work with them, usually what I have to well, do yeah. is... Bring yeah. them in. <laughs> yeah. so, yeah. Because I, I found an old um an old resume of mine because I'm I'm also teaching or gonna be teaching so one of the colleges and, and they wanted to know my C V and my C V is twelve pages long. And and I'm like and they and they wanted to know everything, you know, who I've written for before, where I've taught. And so I just started writing down and it's like, oh my God, I don't even remember doing that. But yeah, I did that too. And so it's, it's you know, and you mentioned, you know, keep it to the last five years of, yeah. um, you know, of stuff. Um, well, I mean, not, still... not necessarily for your bio. I mean, I mean, you know, I'm, okay. I'm sure you, you know, I mean, nobody's expecting you. I, I think that'll be a little sort of odd. <laughs> you know, if you haven't done anything. Yeah. <laughs> I was, I was more talking about your, I, I was more talking about the research when you okay. when you put together this proposal and you look at like comparable titles for example like books that are similar to the book that you want to write or that belong to the same category or whatever that's an area where you want to focus in the last five years for tooting your own horn you have no limits really i mean the only limit for that i would say is relevance you know i mean if you were trying to write a cookbook and you know and you volunteered at a pet shelter is that really relevant no <laughs> you know so uh unless you know you want to cook yeah, yeah. you know 
something. Well, Charlie, you have <laughs> your homework cut out for you. <laughs> yeah, no but, kidding. <laughs> but it's not a, yeah. it, honestly, I mean, it's not, no. not as daunting. It sounds more daunting. I actually think that it's in some ways less daunting for me, of course, easy to say, but I, in some ways I think it's less daunting to put together a nonfiction proposal than it is to put together like a fiction, you know, like to submit 10 pages of like a novel that starts from a blank page. You know, it's like the, the nonfiction yeah. proposal starts from a structure. I don't know, maybe this says something about me, but if there's structure, I can do it. <laughs> yeah, and, and I found, yeah. I, I was asked once to do a, um, you know, a, a proposal on a book. Yeah. And it was so difficult for me to write the proposal that I just wrote the book. And I'm like, here you go. Okay. It, it was easier for me That's to just write to the book. I thought it was funny. <laughs> um, okay. But, you know, then they went backwards. But um, yeah, so I will do that. I'll, right. I'll start. I'll start doing I will that. Thank say, you. I, you're welcome. But I will say about the writing of the book that I would hate for you to write the entire book and then for an editor to come back to you and say, this is a great idea. I just need you to write, rewrite it. <laughs> like, yeah. It, from a different perspective. Mm -hmm. That's where I think the public, the, you know, the proposal yeah. would really help. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. And, and right now, the way I have it set up is that I'm answering the questions. And so I've been asked also to just, you know, do mini videos to answer because it because it's a what you should know so it's like here's 150 things you should know and so just taking you know just taking one thing and and writing about that and taking the next one and writing about that um mm -hmm. so it's it's like a it's like having a, a q a and so the way i'm writing the book is with a big glossary at the end where it's like oh you want to know about bras here you go here you know it's on page 72 go back to the front you know and you want to know about dying well here's you know page 212 you know <laughs> and here's you know here's medication yeah. and and show that sort of thing so i'm i'm, like I'm an writing outline. it with the idea of yeah, yeah with the you know whatever question you have you could just go to the end and know you know, know what the topic is and it'll take you right to the, to the page. It sounds like a manual of sorts, yeah. right? Yeah. Basically. Yeah. 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 Basically. Yeah. All right. So you have your homework, Charlie and Glenda, you have your homework. And uh, we want to say thank you to Adriana for being with us tonight. Um, as everybody knows, we are recording this, so it will be available in a couple of days. And Adriana, we want to say congratulations again for making partner at Evitas. And everybody knows I put down the her query tracker in the chat. So if you have an idea or anything, you know, query her. Make sure that you say that you are with Las Comadres para las Américas. Um, That's Adriana, right. is there any final advice that you want to share with us or anything? No, I mean, the only thing I will say is, you know, just I like to give credit where credit is due. So I will say that this year we launched uh, a national uh, storytellers conference uh, in, in conjunction with Latinx and Kidlet Book Festival. And we had a very successful first year. And the reason I want to give credit is because this is my second time doing that. The first time I did it with Les Uh And we did it for about five years. And um, we, you know, the goal of that is to create was always you know was when we did it with less commodities and it continues to be and we're still doing it in conjunction with less commodities because less commodities is a is a community partner and is to create a pipeline because i think the biggest challenge um for underrepresented groups is really questions like the ones you were asking like where to start how to meet people what what do i need to do and so what we're trying to do with the conference is and, and 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 with talks like this is to to share information and provide sort of um vehicles for our community to have a more direct line into the world of publishing i mean that's what my career has been about for the last 25 years and i i don't expect that will change anytime soon <laughs> so so check that out i mean if you know if you have the means i know it's an investment but we were this year was widely successful i mean it exceeded all my expectations i'm super thrilled about it so and we'll do it again next year. So that's another possibility. You know, writers conferences. If you're a writer, just go because you'll get to meet agents, editors, you know, hear about what's going on in the market and in the and in the world of publishing. And 
the biggest takeaway that we got, again, both from the Let's Come Out conference way back when and now is the community that we're building. And it's the same thing that you guys are doing. It's community building is everything. So yes, community is everything. Yeah. yeah. And I saw that uh, Glenda and uh, Sheila attended your conference a couple of weeks ago and they loved it. They thought it was amazing. Yes. Oh, wonderful. Well, I'm glad to see you again then. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you again. Congratulations on your promotion. And thank you know you. where we are. So if there's any news, and as soon as we find news, we will let you know. Yes, I will do the same. Thank you. Thank you, Comadres. All right. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Take care. Good night.